Hey guys, welcome to another session of RBTL or Reading Between the Lines. This is a session two, uh, another patch update. We have uh, new Moonlight units coming in and uh, we did get to use them. If you uh, experienced them in the journal, Heroes Journal, you could preview their skills. We did experience them last week, so we kind of knew how broken they were. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of people I have heard have been actually uh, purchasing all of the mystic summon packs uh so they can get her so she is released released after this patch and uh again like my usual i'm not going to be showcasing the youtube video for uh, licensing things um if you guys want to watch the video obviously if you have the link to this patch note you could take a look um as their youtube videos are usually you know kind of showcasing their their hero backgrounds so or their lore uh, showcasing a bit of their skills and kind of like where you would want to use them now uh, I was saying that uh, they are not you know the videos are never super super deep so I think that leaves room for videos like mine I guess if you want to talk into some kind of uh, deeper tactics or you know builds and uh, theory crafting um, so uh, first first things first I think uh, silver blade Araminta is is going to be one of the most OP uh, Moonlight units, um, especially for PvP scenarios, so for Arena and GVG. And I don't see any downside to her right now, uh, not 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 the way you would use a mage anyway. Uh, she's incredibly, incredibly strong, her kit is incredibly broken, I would say she's a bit too OP. Uh, I would kind of, you know, it, if, if she's so OP, it kind of makes me worry about the future meta. Um, Unless there's like a new unit coming right after that counters her whole kit or something. But anyways, let's get into her skills. Uh, so again, I'm going to just give a shout out to to some of the guys on stream here uh, who really care about my content. And they were saying that, uh, you know, I did a take before and uh, my uh, browser window wasn't zoomed in. So you guys can read the notes. So this is take two. Um, we'll take a look at the skill. So one thing, first things first, is that she's a mage. I really want to get into that. Being a mage has access to mage artifacts, and what does that mean for especially Silver Blade Araminta? There is a mage artifact that if you um, uh, get it to, I think, plus 15, you can get a full 10 souls, like, right at the get-go. Um, so, uh, generally, you would use that on, like, a manual team. You would never use it on, like, a defense team in GVG or whatever. It's a waste of an artifact slot if you use it on a defense team. But uh, on uh, a manual team, so offense team, um, you can get 10 to 20 souls. 20 souls is if you plus 30, you max enhance it. Uh, that artifact will give you 20 souls. Why that's important is if you look at the S1 here, an active skill, if you read it, attacks the enemy with an explosion of flame with a 65% chance to burn for one turn. 65% is already extremely high. Um, based on the soul burn effect, it increases to 100% and ignores the effect resistance. Uh, based on this description, and I'm pretty sure you probably wouldn't be able to skill enhance the effect, the effectiveness of this, uh, of this skill. Most likely it's probably just damage for all five or how, however many skill enhancements it has. But if you take a look, the soul burn only consumes 10 souls, which is extremely broken. I mean, someone who doesn't even own a plus 30 of that artifact, which is relatively quite expensive. You have to pull multiples um, and just the gold and the charms required for you to max that artifact is incredibly insane so a 10 soul means that right off the bat right as you enter when she gets a turn you're able to soul burn it and you're able to burn your enemy if they don't have immunity because it ignores the effect resistance right if you ignore the effect resistance she barely needs effectiveness um but arguably speaking she will still need a ton of effectiveness for the rest of her skills but the passive, the S2, this is why it's broken. If you soul burn the first one and they are on fire, or if they are burned, um, it activates flame release. So it says here, um, after using flame friction and flame release attacks all enemies with mystic fire energy, increasing the caster's combat readiness by 30%. A 30% CR boost is just absolutely insane for herself. It really sets her up for the next round, uh, the next turn. The S S3 is also absolutely insane too. Um, let's take a look at the After Awakening. I don't think we need to look at the before one. After Awakening, it drops a giant meteor, stuns all enemies for one turn, and then with a 40% chance, but max 50, so if you skill enhance it, chance to inflict three burn effects for two turns. 
Now, if, it, if this works kind of like Curious, where you can get multiple poisons in one skill, I do believe that each stack of the burn is rolled with effectiveness and effect resistance. I might be wrong, I might be wrong, um, but uh, I believe that's how it works. Now, when I was trying her out in the Hero's Journal, previewing the skills, I was able to get about two to three burns on those punching bags pretty easily. Now, I don't know what innate effect resistance or even if they even have any effect resistance. Um, <laughs> thanks, Aline. Aline is just like, you're not wrong. Um, I don't know if they have high effect resistance, but I was able to get like two to three burns and the stun was like, it happened almost all the time. Now, I don't know, again, I think the stun is, it seems to be 100% stun, because since there's no mention of the percentage, 100% stun, so that means it's rolling the effectiveness with effect resistance. So, how would you build uh, Silverblade Araminta, and where do I see her uh, in the arena comp? Now, arena comps can be, get very, it can be very complicated, depends on who you're going up against, and like I said, I don't think Sarah Blade Araminta is absolutely, like, must in a defense team. But she can definitely work in a defense team. I think in a defense team though, she would definitely need to be in a speed team. So CR boosters, like extremely fast CR boosters, so that if you're in a defense team, the offense team is always gambling whether or not they can beat your CR boosters. Now there are a couple counters to CR boosters. Um, so for example, uh, Harado is a very very good CR booster counter. Um, since most CR boosters, unless you're running like Skuri, you're using a non-attack uh, skill. And Hirado, um, if you built him fast enough, one of his passives, or one of his, yeah, one of his passives is if the enemy uses a non-attacking uh, skill, so let's say like uh, Ruse is S3, Judas is S3, um, anyone's uh, skill that doesn't actually use an attack, Hirado actually boosts his own combat readiness. And so if he jumps in front of the line, he can dispel your whole team. And if he crits, he, he, they can have like C Dominial being pushed up and then her doing her buff and you can pretty much get wiped. So there's a lot of counters to it. So on a defense team, I don't think Sir, uh, Silver Blade Araminta will shine. It might shine for people who do not have no idea like, you know, how to take, take on your team, your team comp. Uh, but that's my thought because I think in an offense team, her best in slot will most likely be that artifact that I mentioned. Actually, you know, it's kind of my bad. I, actually, I can't remember the, the name off the top of my head. But anyways, if you play the game, you know what artifact I'm talking about. Uh, most likely that will be the best in slot if you're running her in PvP. Um, because I don't think she's going to be a heavy, heavy damage dealer. Even though, you know, one can say... I, I read her mo skill mods. Not insanely... Not insanely strong, but they're all really good. That's the that's the part where she's broken. And if you want to really benefit from the burn effects, you would really want to like max out her attack, since uh, burn is damage over time, but scaled from the uh, the casters, the original, the originators max attack. So that's including after buffs too. So post buff, um, it calculates the attack on that. So if you have like let's say two to three burns, that's enough. Generally, that's enough to wipe out most people i would say in her in her build if you're building her um you know i think she needs quite a bit of speed if you want her to get there in time to be able to do her s3 before getting killed um uh, whether you're running a cr booster ahead of her or or not she does need quite a bit of speed um and that, that would the speed would also really benefit her s2 that 30 percent cr boost um, you would need a ton of effectiveness. I would say, you know, 55 or higher. The higher it is, the better, because I think a lot of her, her skills really require that effectiveness. I would say the S3 really requires it. Once that S3 goes off, it's gonna be, it's gonna be quite insane. Now, we'll d I will talk about, uh, immunity set in a bit, well, when we get to that news portion. Um, but I think, again, maxing her attack, but she hardly needs critical rate. Or critical damage, and what that means for Silver Blade, Silver Blade Araminta is that she's extremely easy to build. Really, only three stats that you're looking for: attack, effectiveness, and um, and speed. At least that's that's what I'm thinking right now. So I would I would think that you most likely run an attack set. 
um, maybe speed set with really high attack, uh, main stats and sub stats, and of course you get your uh, effectiveness in there. Now obviously I think, you know, as just a damage dealer, her mods are not bad anyway. Um, I think they're like the 1.5, 1.6 range. It's not terrible at all. It's not, absolutely not. Um, but, um, uh, you know, having having some crit rate would, would do, but I think critical hit damage is the, absolutely the one that you don't need. Uh, I don't remember her base HP, but uh, it's not super high. So going with really high HP, yes, you can get maybe 10k HP, but probably no higher if you're going to stretch for all those stats. But um, how much is the modifier for the burn? Um, I don't... Actually, I'm not quite sure. And then, yeah, Aline, Aline said it to you. It's a... T Tagahel's ancient book or Tagahel's tome or something like that. Um, how much is the modifier for the burn? I'm not quite sure for each burn. I'm not quite sure. Um, but all I know is that uh, a, a mage with about 3k attack uh, with a solid burn can do about like 3, 3, 3k to 4k damage. So I think it's almost 1 for 1, I think. 1 times mod per burn though per burn so that's uh, incredibly strong um even if it's not one and most likely it's like a 0 0.9 or 0 0.8 something very close to that uh, but of course the, the damage over time does affect with defense so if you burn like a high defense uh hero um obviously the damage is not gonna do you know too much but still it's still still quite a bit um, again skill her attack high 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 and i think you're gonna get the most benefit from it now the only thing is that we have uh, immunity sets and immunity meta may become a thing and so if you're planning on running silver blade araminta and which people are most likely going to be farming immunity sets for all maybe all of their heroes maybe they leave one you'll need someone to cleanse it cleanse their immunity before your silver blade araminta can get a turn because really she strives on dealing the status ailments if she doesn't do any any debuffs she's pretty much just dead weight in that in that sense she gets no cr boost she gets no no help for the rest of the team now another thing i think silver blade a uh, silver blade i keep saying so uh a silver blade araminta is good for again that stun is really good for someone like ml says to finish off and again if it's a hundred percent hundred percent stun you're really just rolling the effectiveness versus their effect resistance if they don't have immunity so that's uh, pretty pretty amazing uh okay so someone says burn is 30 percent of the caster's attack the total attack after buff well okay 30 percent is actually not that high vpp says it's 0 0.7 times with a 70 percent ign defense ignore hmm yeah they'd be they'd be interesting to find out i do know that it can do quite a bit of damage though um so i still i don't think it's definitely not a deal breaker, regardless of how low the mod is. But again, if you're if you are building her, the high attack is uh, very very important. Um, so Blaze Dingo, uh, also very interesting hero. Uh, he is a soul weaver, so he can heal, and he could do quite a bit of damage. Um, his base attack is quite low though, so but uh, people want to build him to output maximum damage. So high attack good crit rate and you actually you do want almost a hundred percent crit rate for him um, because he really benefits from it and then uh you want high um high uh critical hit damage um uh, early on it was discussed in our uh, discord and i'm pretty sure everyone came to the same conclusions that he most likely shine in high hp fights so high hp monsters like uh, abyss uh hell raid um, so Abyss is just going to keep expanding. We know that, you know, the way they, they've they made the Abyss means it's, it's infinitely scalable. You can get, get up to 200 floors in the future. Who knows what this, how long this game is going to last, but 200 floors in the future with enemies maybe like 1 million HP, whatever. I don't know, I'm just, just putting that up there. But Blaze Dingo becomes really strong because uh, if you take a look at his skills, all of his healing comes from his proportion to the, his damage dealt. Um... So it's uh, if people had uh, a lot of fun using Bologna running Bloodstone in the Abyss, he brings it even better, better mods, better healing mods uh, over bl something like Bloodstone. I think Bloodstone maximum you get is 20, 20% healing, I think. 
I'm at I'm at a 16.9 right now. I'm not quite sure actually. Maybe maybe it's even 30. Um, but his S1, his heal mod for his S1 is 30%. His S2 is 50%, if I re recall correctly. Um, but if you take a look, um, S1 attack enemy with a sharp dagger, healing the ally with the lowest health. So it works exactly like Bloodstone. Um, amount recovery increases proportion to the damage dealt. <clears throat> so if you do 10,000 damage, um, you heal 30% of that. That is incredibly, incredibly good, right? That's a three, three thousand, three thousand heal, correct? So, Toph says needs testing. You're talking about Araminta, right? Um, and if you take a look at the S2 here, attacks enemy with a giant gauntlet. Oh, actually, let's take a look at the after awakening portion. So, yeah, attacks enemy with a giant gauntlet, healing the ally with the lowest health again. So, but this is a 50% mod, okay, 50% of your damage dealt goes to the healing of the lowest, lowest HP, which is incredibly, incredibly strong. Um, a critical hit, though, activates punishment, so the S1, amount recovered increases proportional to damage dealt. Um, if I recall in the video, it looks like it gives him a second turn, but he's only allowed to use punishment. So you can select multiple targets if you critical hit with the S2. Now there is a three three turn cooldown, so that of course that makes it less broken, but it's still incredibly, incredibly good. That means I think in your rotation, if you're using him, let's say for PvE content, um, you can save his his cooldown. So for uh, sorry for his S2, so you can save it until you actually need healing if you can get his critical hit rate high so like 90 percent 100 percent you really want to keep that but keep in mind that he is a light elemental so being dark and light elemental means that you have no misses because you have no elemental weakness right um except when you get attacked um but when you're attacking you have no elemental weakness so uh this is incredibly incredibly good um, so definitely if you're building him, I think he needs as much high damage output as possible. He has very, very low base HP though, um, for Soul Weaver. So you do want to get his HP up there too. So attack, critical hit rate, health, um, uh, critical hit damage, and most likely speed as well. You don't want your healer to be lagging behind um, when you need to heal off. At least match up to your, your damage dealers or your main units. Or faster than them. That's at least what you need. What is required, at least for PVE. Now I'm a I'm a bit of a hypocrite because my uh, my Angelica is extremely slow. Everyone knows this if you're watching my videos. She has 106 speed, <laughs> which uh, really makes her kind of useless. But anyways, I'm just saying that uh, realistically, he want to build them with high speed. So so for him, yes, you you need some speed there. I would say 100 100. 150 to 160 at least is like minimal requirements, especially for PVE scenarios. But the faster you can get, the better. So I would may maybe run, maybe run a speed set like right off the bat, regardless if you run a speed boot or not. But everything else, I think, stands. Anyways, S3 uh, heals an ally, uh, and the caster with sacred power grants invincibility for one turn and increases attack for two turns. Um, I think the invincibility is just to himself. I'm not quite sure if the attack is AoE, but judged by the reading of this, I think it's just himself as well. Um, again, which is really good, works really well with his kit, because it, like I said, um, if you buff yourself, the more damage you do, the more healing you also receive, so that's really good. Um, amount recovered, of course, uh, again, proportional to the caster's attack. Oh, this one's a, oh, okay, so this one is recovered proportional to the caster's attack, so you want to maybe get, uh, maybe get him to, uh, to go with higher attack. Then it's a balance. It's a balance. Um, I don't think you're. Oh, it's AOE. The invincibility is AOE too. Oh, I see. I see. Who? Okay, whoever he targets. So it's single target, but you can select it. I see. I see. Okay. Oh, that's really good. That's really good. Him and an ally. He he is he is extremely good. Um, we were we were theory crafting this when he was a uh, you know kind of showcased too. Um, soul burn effect is twenty souls, but grants an extra turn. Uh, cooldown if you enhance it, you get a minimum of four. That's very very usable. He's a very good soul weaver. Um, again, I would think 
I would think he would be your go-to Soul Weaver, at least one of them. Maybe, if you're not primary, maybe a secondary healer. When you're tackling something like Abyss, I think he's going to be some some meta-changing meta Soul Weaver. Again, based on him doing damage, dealing damage, and healing based on damage, I don't think he runs very well in GVG and PvP scenarios. I can't see that working, most likely. If you run him with high HP monsters, give Daydream Joker to him. That would really benefit his healing potential and his damage output. Um, but in the YouTube video um, from Smilegate, they featured him in the arena, which I really don't think that's the place they should feature him. They, they should have really showcased his healing potential in like a high HP boss. But like I said, this is where videos like mine can kind of fit in, I guess. Um, if they don't handle all aspects of the hero and how to use them, we can cover it here. So that's kind of cool. Oh, VPP makes a good point. Actually, I didn't think about this. So if you use a Soul Burn, it wastes invincibility on itself since it grants the extra turn and is a one-turn invincibility buff. Oh, uh, that's a very good point. But it's not—it's definitely not unusable for sure. I think then the Soul Burn effect becomes uh, more of if you need to get more heals going, right? Just in case you, you, you're, you're about to die, um, I think this can work. You guys just heard my uh, my in-game my in-game uh, return of my of my stuff. <laughs> uh, it is. I'm gonna I'm gonna hide that. It is. Let's continue. So we have a, a new hunt. So this is what I was talking about. Originally, in my previous RBTL, I was saying that with with the new patch changes of how you can acquire stats and substats. Um, I was saying that no longer will you really farm raid for gear because uh, unless you're farming for the uh, immunity sets, the rage sets, and the unity sets. But now we got a new hunt and this is going to really shift the dynamic. Now I'm, I'm really kind of skeptical on the value of doing raids other than getting to the queen each week other than getting your ancient coins in order to get passes for hell raid if you're that far into the game because now with this new hunt we got a new all three new sets so the unity uh, immunity and rage sets are available to be dropped now with like t85 or level 85 gear when you get to like hunt 10 and 11 it really really makes you you know because so lately i've been getting like pretty good drops from the raid and i've been like upgrading the gear now i'm kind of salty about it because they're left at like whatever they were like 67 level 67 so you're gonna miss out on a couple of your you know your base stats um it's not the it's not the the best potential now obviously if you had old old pieces with like really good substats and you know everyone knows substats super rng you're not really going to be too salty about this but i'm saying everyone is going to be hunting this if you if you're deep in gvg and pvp most likely you're going to start seeing immunity set um meta so make sure uh when you're planning your your teams um, don't rely solely on defense breakers unless you know you can cleanse the debuffs. Now, this is also interesting because with the release of Charles, Charles, uh, like units like Cleary, uh, like Harado, uh, people that can dispel are gonna be uh, are gonna be absolutely meta now. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna be basically seeing defense teams with full immunity sets, um, offense teams with dispellers. And then the rest of the rotation so defense break attack buff and then a cleaver or something like that you're gonna start seeing that kind of stuff more and more often it's very good it's very exciting because it really changes the way we are prioritizing our gear um and also our hunting our gear too so no, if you if you go like you know max max out wyvern and all of your heroes are all like you know speed and all that um you're not gonna really be doing much if the defense team you're facing against has full immunity sets, right? Um, Toff says Hirado meta LOL. You know, Hirado gets a bad rap. Hirado is actually insanely good, his kit. 
Um, he he can fit in a lot of team comps. I know you're joking, Toph. I know you know he's good, but seriously, I think he's gonna be meta. People people who kind of like neglect him is I think mainly because he's a meme and he's a three star. But honestly, I've seen some that can be really really incredible. So I'm actually thinking of building him um, because I really do see this coming. People are gonna be hunting this like crazy. And again, immunity set is cheap, right? It's two piece, two piece set. You get two solid pieces, and you can fit the rest in whatever build you're gonna go for for every single, every single hero. So it's extremely cheap, extremely easy to do. Now uh, we don't know exactly, you know, how this hunt is gonna be, how difficult it is, but uh, most likely we're kind of all guessing this with uh, the new uh, moonlight units being light elemental with uh, specialty change uh, Captain Rickerus, uh, which we'll, we'll cover in a bit. Uh, I think there's going to be some kind of light elemental, dark elemental bent to this one, kind of like the rest of the Hunt 11s. So so mainly, we're all going to be aiming for Hunt 11. I think that's the goal. Um, most likely, it's either like the, he does like like more damage if you're not light elemental, or you do more damage if you're light elemental, something like that or you get status ailments if you're not late elemental, or something like that. Um, most likely it's gonna be uh, that. So I think that kind of forces people to do Rikaris' specialty change, uh, forcing people to kind of like, you know, try to ham for Araminta, etc. Uh, tough, tough, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't forget you can carry that mage artifact. Are you talking, talking about Harado? So item drops is the same. Let's take a look. So let's go to 11. I no need to cover everything here. Um, same same kind of drops. Um, you get equipment drops. Uh, you get uh, gold, skystone, powder of knowledge, covenant bookmarks, mystic metals, and energy. Now I'm going to say this for most of the people in my community and myself as well. It's very salty to run a hunt 11. And getting Skystone or Powder of Knowledge, or even Covenant Bookmarks, because you get like 1 to 2. <laughs> it's kind of salty, or energy, actually, in fact. I don't I don't know if people appreciate getting like half the energy back that you spent on Hunt 11 when they're farming for gear. Um, I don't think that really does anything for them. That's, that's kind of like a slap in the face. It's like, oh yeah, you got like this half-off free try, right? That, I don't think anyone really cares about the energy, so... <laughs> It kind of it kind of sucks. Mystic metals, I'm on the fence about. Um, you get like maybe one again one fifth of the mystic mystic pull, just like the covenant bookmarks. But mystic metals, in my opinion, have more value than covenant bookmarks, just because you can control what you're pulling more. Uh, narrower narrower unit pool or hero hero summon pool, with with narrower uh, artifact pool too. So I mean. Mystic Metals, I'm, I'm kind of like, okay, you can keep that in. It would be nice if they jack it up to like 10 Mystic Metals per. I know that's asking a lot, but you get generally like 6 to 7. Um, I think you can get 10, but but still, it's very, very low. So, Smilegate, if you're if you're watching this, and you're listening to this, please remove Sky Stones, remove Powder of Knowledge, and remove the Energy. It's just... And Covenant Bookmarks, so why not? Just keep the drop rates for the gear, maybe Mystic Metals once in a while, but I think that's pretty good. Uh, Rob, yeah, I think it differing opinions, Rob. So, Ro Ali and Rob says that energy is fine, um, since he gets materials plus the gold. Oh, actually, that's, that's true, that's a good point. Yeah, so for half the energy, you get the gold and the materials. Yeah, okay, never mind, never mind. You're right, you're right. Um, energy, I guess you can keep, but yeah, the powder of knowledge and skystone, pretty, pretty slap in the face. Um, so sturdy, so carapace seems to be, huh. Yeah, the hunt equipment. Yeah, so this is a preview. Preview here. It kind of looks ugly. The weapon. I don't know. Like I, some of you guys, I think, are on the same line as me. So like, if you get like um, like a banshee, banshee equipment, like level eighty five. It's like this cool looking axe, you know. Um, like the wyverns is like this cool looking sword and whatnot. But I don't know if you want to use a club. I don't know. That's a, that's me picking on like. You, you you don't you don't see your heroes using it, but it's kind of like really cool when you're looking at your gear when the graphics look cool. But if you're using this kind of like weird bulbous mace thing, I don't know. Maybe the maybe the 85 looks pretty good, I guess. 
It's really spiky, but it still really looks weird. It looks like one of those fruits with the <laughs> with the spiky things. Being nitpicky says tough. Yeah, I'm being nitpicky, man. Hey, man, I'm a I'm a graphic designer by trade, so I uh, I I pick on that kind of stuff. But you know who cares? People use it for function. No one's in a not equip a weapon just because it's ugly. It's like ew. This got really good base stats and sub stats, but I'm not gonna use it because it's ugly. No, I no, no one's gonna do that. I'm just saying it could have been cooler. I think swords, man. Um, mm. this is all pretty pretty self-explanatory stuff. All the same stuff. You get um, you do get clear rewards um, with the reputation, but I think it's a one-time reward. So I mean, it's not it's not gonna be like too too great. I think I guess. All right, so we have uh, Rickerus SC. Specialty change Captain Rickerus comes on, and uh, he—I uh, I don't know about you guys, but I think he looks somewhat underwhelming. Um, so specialty change the new spear. If you take a look, 75% uh, chance to dispel a buff, a uh, max of 100%. So I don't know if that max 100 comes from the specialty change or the skill enhance. I think it's skill enhance. Chance to dispel a buff from the target uh, before having a 75% chance to stun enemy with highest combat readiness, regardless of skill miss. So that's kind of nice. Recovers caster health after attack. Amount recover proportion to the caster's attack. This dispel is probably going to be the the thing that I was talking about. Um, you want to run a dispeller if you're going to be running against immunity immunity set meta. If you have someone like Silverblade Araminta. And if you do have Rickerus, he is relatively cheap, um, but it's just that you have to skill enhance him. Uh, not for the debuff, I believe the debuff actually comes before that, um, before even his skill enhancements. Um, but regardless, uh, something to consider there. Uh, it's kind of interesting that they do bring a specialty change unit once per month, but... Uh, I was I was hearing someone actually mention this on Discord that people are complaining that all the new specialty change heroes are very niche. Like you use them like so like for Hazel, really use user has a fire attack buffer. Um, Ruzid is not that niche though. Actually, I don't know what they're complaining about. I don't I don't see that they're super niche. They're actually quite usable. Um, but I think people are expecting kind of like Falcon or Cleary level stuff. <laughs> Um, just a little little thing. I think Falcon and Cleary is too overpowered, and I actually don't like that aspect. She's just too good at everything, right? Too good at everything. She has everything in her kit. It's like a like team heal, double turn, CR boost, um, like cleanse, uh, or dispel, uh, dispel, armor break, provoke. It's just incredibly annoying. She's super annoying to fight too. Terror is like, he, Terror is just trying to play the advocate, he's trying to just make me look bad, he's just saying that f Cleary is so niche man, all she does is provoke and slap you with a rubber sword, what are you talking about man, she's so broken. Uh, King of nothing, hey man, welcome, welcome. Alright, so let's let's continue on here, um, typical stuff, not gonna cover the specialty change, I'm gonna speed this up here. So skill skill tree, um, I think this is where it's kind of underwhelming, especially for me. I'm not quite sure how I would be building him to be honest. I, ideally, I think really high speed, but judging by this, I mean, increase health by ten. Okay, decrease uh, increase defense by ten. Critical hit chance by five. Effectiveness by ten. All right, that's all really good. It saves your saves you from uh, stretching your gear. Increase the damage dealt supreme spear by five percent. That's the max. Okay, healing supreme spear by 200%. That is pretty decent. Um, damage dealt increased by 20% when uh, attacking dark el dark elemental target. Again, depending on how you build them, and I think you know, I really do think that this dark elemental target thing is for the hunt. You know, like th yes, there are dark elemental bosses, dark elemental uh, people that you fight in PvP, but 20% uh, it, it is good, but don't know if his full kit really desires that 20% in a damage damage dealt. I really see him not as a full damage dealer, but more like a almost I guess I guess more like Charles kind of, but not a not a knight. Um so kind of kind of like Charles. 
do damage while while doing some debuffs and buffs for your team. Uh, has a 30% max chance to inflict additional damage with quick pierce when attacking a dark elemental target. Damage dealt increases proportion to cast its attack. That's kind of interesting, I guess. Ah, uh, actually, it's not that bad. It's just I don't think I don't think he brings enough to the table that you need to farm him. I think that's I think that's the point that people are making. It's not that he's bad. Uh, it's not terrible. Has a hundred percent max chance to dispel debuff on the caster when the caster's ooh when the caster's health is below twenty percent at the beginning of the turn. That's that's pretty good. So maybe maybe for him. So self self dispel debuff. So that's kind of like fighter fighter Maya. But you want his health to be high then. Otherwise it's gonna be kinda dangerous if you want to risk him at 20%. Hold on one second here. He is a warrior. I'll have to take a look at his uh, base base HP. But he is a three star though, so he doesn't get that um that uh, four percent or six percent health uh, health boost that you would get from a four star or five star innate, um, which is kind of kind of kind of crappy for him, I guess. Increases attack and defense by twenty percent, max when caster's health is below fifty percent. Actually, it's not terrible at all. I don't know what people are talking about here, um, but uh, I'm still leveling up my Ricker, so I don't think I'm gonna get that really quick. Uh, okay, quick, quick, quick. Let's do this. So, epic catalyst adjustments. Uh, this is this is good. This is good to know. Keep this in mind. At these stages. So, when people are asking, "Hey, man, we're gonna get these uh, these uh, epic artifacts," keep these stages in mind. I'm I might even refer back to my own video. <laughs> yes, I'm one of those guys. It's like I watch my own video, guys. I watch my own video just to be able to find this, so I don't have to bother my my community asking, "Hey, guys, we're gonna get nightmare masks." Um, Nightmare Masks, I think currently, before this change, you, you're supposed to only get them in world like 8 or 9, and the run is extremely hard. So when it's a 2-S6, I'm, I'm assuming because it's a 2-S6, it's pretty easy. That's actually really good. So Fuse Nerve, Nightmare Mask, Black Curse Powder, Heart of Hypocrisy, I mean, um, most of the units people run, especially for PvP in GVG, Need these exactly these fuse nerve like Deanne, uh Charles lately that would be really great. This is this is such good news for me because I really want to farm his uh, epic catalyst nightmare mask for like Kron, Sid, F Cleary, all these units, and black curse powder for like a Cartuja. If you're still using says, I don't think you're using him, but I'm just listing people off the top of my head. Heart of hypocrisy, I think used for Angelica, Destina. Um, Tenebria, like a ton of healers, a ton of mages uh, require Heart of Hypocrisy. So, I mean, this is this is fantastic. We, we do need it. I was, I was kind of, uh, you know, kind of sad to see when originally, before this change is going to happen, I was kind of sad to see, like, oh, Epic Catalyst is so kind of rare. Like, like, for one Epic Catalyst, you can only, like, run, like, one or two stages, but, like, really far off. So, like, you wouldn't be able to, like, farm your fodders while you're doing it, but now you can, right? The Heart of Hypocrisy is all in 9-3 though, so that is, that's quite difficult. But do keep in mind that you can get Nightmare Masks, you can get Heart of Hypocrisy, you can get, I think, Black Curse Powder as well, in the raid shop. So if you do farm the raid, you can get those, but they do cost 3 runs, so 3 boss fights. So it's kinda, eh, they're, they're good to have if you don't want to farm, but uh, it's kind of expensive to me. Memory imprint changes, I'm um, just going to roughly say this. So before, if you, let's say if you had two, uh, okay, so let's say before you had Enot at SSS, if you fused him to an Enot that wasn't an SSS, you lose the imprint entirely, but now actually carries over, so that's actually kind of good. So if you have multiple, let's say you have like two, two heroes at A, I don't know why you would imprint two heroes, but let's say you did, and you want to make them SSS, um, you can do it now, which is great. This is a good good change, definitely needed. But there is a warning here, as uh, most of you guys know, uh, you do get reputation rewards. I think covenant bookmarks, so that's pretty good. Good reputation reward. Covenant bookmarks if you SSS uh, a certain amount of heroes. I think every five SSS hero, you get a couple covenant bookmarks. I think it's like two, three, three, four pulls or something. Pretty good. Um, but this warning in the system will say that you you're not allowed to keep, you know, 
doing it. So you're not allowed to like recycle an SSS unit, fuse it into a non-SSS unit, make them SSS again, and get the reputation reward. It gives you a pop-up saying that you're not going to get that uh, achievement. So just keep that in mind. Um, transmitting improves increased resources. So now um, that's actually really good. If you take a look at that, it actually gives you the amount. I think that's the exact amount uh, of uh, silver transmute stones that you get per unit that you fused to the base unit. So if it's SSS, depending on what star you're at, you have a certain amount of units. And uh, everyone knows that if you transmit a three star base minimum, you do get one transmute stone per three star base. So you get eight right there because there's eight E knots for an SSS, one for the base and seven copies. So that's really good to know. Um, so if you do want to transmute some SSS heroes, let's say if you're a whale, get multiple SSS three star heroes and you want to get some extra resources back, you can do it that way now. You don't have to actually, you know, kind of waste that SSS um, if you're not going to use them. But most likely with specialty changes, I think everybody's going to be keeping a couple three stars uh, at least one copy of the SSS 3 star. Um, one thing I want to say, um, uh, the, the rest of the stuff, rest of the changes I'm not going to talk about, but because I did pull Charles and I did invest a lot of time into him, I do want to say this, this hero change here, improvements. This is an improvement. There's not a bug fixes. I, I don't think this is a bug fix rather than it's improvement. So Charles' slash now correctly activates smash even if the target is defeated. Now, I don't know what this looks like. So usually Slash has a proc rate, so it has a, has a percent to proc Smash to follow up. If there are if the enemy is buffed, it has a 50% chance to proc. If it's, they're not buffed, you have a 25% chance to, to proc Smash, which is the S2. Which is kind of interesting because I don't think... Um, so, so, so originally, if you killed an enemy with Slash, Obviously, you won't even proc smash, but I don't know what this means. Even if the enemy is defeated, you proc it. Does that mean you do an overkill? Because there's no absolutely no uh, uh, no benefit to it, unless it means you proc smash onto another target that's alive. Then I think that is a fix. Otherwise, even if he does do smash on a defeated target, that's not going to do much because what smash does is dispel the buff. Um, and does more damage if you're buffed, which doesn't make any sense. So I'm not quite sure. Oh, wait, 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 wait. So Terror, Terror is saying that he doesn't think it does anything, saves animation time. So if the enemy was defeated before, you can activate Smash? So Terror, I think, is saying that no wait, that doesn't make sense. So I thought Terra was saying you can save animation time because originally the error was it activates Smash, but I don't think that's the case. Oh, are you serious? Okay, so okay, so I I've misread this then. The way it's worded, it feels like it now correctly activates Smash, even if the target is defeated. What is that? Like, see, it says that now correctly activates it, makes it... So Terra is saying that currently, before this patch update, if Charles kills with the S1, it can still proc the S2. I've actually never run it, ran into that. I see, I see. So, okay, so I think that's the only way it makes sense then. I, I'm, I was wrong, so my initial assumption was wrong. I've never seen it proc the S2 after I kill someone with the S1. So that's why I thought... Uh, and plus the wording says now correctly activate smash. What is, wouldn't that, that wording needs to change then? That that gives the uh, that gives the del illusion that uh, it actually activates it, whereas it didn't activate it before. Anyways, I don't know. Maybe maybe my grammar is wrong. Maybe my English is wrong. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. The other stuff is a lot of skill skill changes, skill description, uh, inventory. I don't think this is really important to cover. This is kind of cool. I do like this feature. I do think that uh, when you're doing a run. Um, having the chat channel transparent is quite nice because honestly, before before the chat was covering the enemies. Um, if you're if you're autoing anyways, I suppose that doesn't matter. My thing is, I think this is a, a device to device thing. Is that if I'm using my Android and I'm, I'm playing on my mobile and I'm typing in the chat, 
the keyboard overtakes the entire screen, which makes me unable to use the chat while I'm actually playing the game. So the only way I can use the chat is if I'm on Nox or on an emulator. So that kind of sucks for me, but I think it's a device to device thing. I think it's just my device is badly designed uh, keyboard overlay, which uh, again, it covers the entire screen. So you, it's not like, you know, you can really enjoy the transparency of it, but it's really nice that they thought of it. So I, I do, I do applaud them for that. Terra says, then it's broken. Okay, well, he says, yeah, he does, he does say the wording is confusing. If it does activate Smash on someone else, then it's broken. Because Smash doesn't have any other buffs, if I remember. Smash doesn't have buffs, no. Smash smashes, but these spells buffs. So, it could, it could be broken, you're right. But it could be good. I mean, because <laughs> you can you can kill off one target and then debuff another. I think that would be really cool. But anyways, I think uh, I think we'll have to see. I, I I think Terror is right. I just never seen Smash being proc'd after someone died from the S one, uh, and the wording is confusing, like you said. So I, I'm 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 I don't even I'm not even sure anymore. I, I just thought that it meant that if the target is defeated, the Smash would activate whether on the target that is defeated which is pointless like we've kind of talked about or it's on another target that's what i wanted to get to but anyways um we'll move we move on we press on uh i think that's it i think that's all i wanted to cover everything else i think is pretty pretty minimal uh as in big changes but anyways i'm gonna go back up here and uh, go back to our silver blade aramintha so i know if you guys are watching this thank you guys again uh on stream uh for also helping me uh, reset my screen so that people can actually read the notes um, but yeah let me know what you guys think on YouTube uh, are you gonna be trying to pull for Silverblade Araminta in my opinion I don't see I don't see many weaknesses to her herself it's only circumstantial that she will be used or not so like if people have immunity sets for example but I think she is really, really good. So I myself, I'm preparing to be pulling for her. Hopefully I get her. She would be my first ML five star. Um, but if you guys, uh, you know, do pull her, you consider yourself extremely lucky. I really don't see many downfalls with her. And I'm gonna end that there. Um, if you guys have Discord, check out the Discord server, follow me on Twitter and subscribe to YouTube if you haven't. As always, thank you guys for watching and I will see you on the next Reading Between the Lines.